Okay. Ooh, okay. The mics are working tonight. There we go. <laughs> um, welcome to the RSU5 uh, Board of Directors meeting. It is Wednesday, January 25th, 2023. We are here in the Freeport High School Library. Susanna and Jill will not be with us tonight. We're not sure about Maura yet. Hopefully she's coming in, maybe taking a little extra time with the weather out there. Um, but we'll get started in the meantime with the Pledge of Allegiance. Do I have a motion for consideration and approval of the minutes from the January 11, 2023 meeting as presented, barring any errors or omissions? Colin, thank you. Beth, all those in favor? Great, none opposed. Welcome, Maura. Um, adjustments to the agenda? There are none this evening. All right, so we're just flying along here. Um, we will throw it over to Piper for our good news and recognition, our report from our student rep. All right, in the athletics department, we have an alpine ski race tomorrow at Pleasant Mountain. There was a Nordic ski meet today at Pineland, and the boys and girls varsity basketball teams are playing Cape tomorrow, girls at home and boys away. Our FHS engineering and design lab class has learned to sew and woodworking in the forms of creating a cornhole boards and matching bean bags. Thank you. <laughs> and they're now up for auction. The RSU5 Performing Arts Boosters has their monthly meeting at Durham Community School February 2nd. And we finished midterms last week and yesterday due to some snow days shaking stuff up. And our NHS offered tutoring in the library during study halls and after school. And 21 students were recently recognized with as Maine Scholastic Art Award recipients. These are state awards honoring originality, skill, and personal voice in art. I just want to put a word out for those cornhole boards. I bought them a couple years ago when the students made them, and I still have them. We use them. And they're great. So, and they're really fun design. So, if anybody's interested. So Piper is officially in her final semester, starting today of high school. So, congratulations! One more semester to go. All right. Um, so we will move on to public comment. I don't think we have a ton of the public joining us this evening. But there is another opportunity at the end of the agenda. Um, so we'll move on to reports from the superintendent. Okay, good evening again. Um, let me start number one, some district happenings. Um, I'm pleased to inform the board uh, that we've been informed that our families staying at the Best Western will be allowed to stay through the end of February. The Quality Housing Coalition will continue to work diligently with these families in hopes of having the last few housed by the end of February. And we had, uh, we have seen movement of of uh, of students who are who are moved to some permanent housings. We're absolutely thrilled for those families. Sad to lose them, but thrilled for those families. Uh, I always like to share a little bit about the power of student voice. Uh, the Student Advisory Committee at Palno Elementary School is holding a sock drive for homeless individuals. This idea actually came from a PES student who was in Boston over the holiday break and um, saw a similar, learned of a similar drive and that student brought it back to the Student Advisory Committee and they are now having their own sock drive for the homeless. And I'm, I, I, Piper stole my thunder a little bit, but it's okay. Uh, about the Maine Scholastic Art Competition, several of our Freeport High School students receive awards for their submission to the annual Maine Scholastic Art Competition. Our teachers describe this event, this event as states for arts. Judges look for the works that exemplify the award's core values, originality, skill, and the emergence of a personal voice or vision. Work is celebrated that is unique, blurs boundaries, and challenges assumptions. Individual artwork was selected to receive a gold key, a silver key, or an honorable mention. Gold key recipients have automatically been pulled for national medal awards, which will be announced in March, so maybe we'll have some of those national awards as well. 
gold and silver key works will be featured in an exhibition at Maine College of Art and Design this spring. And a few a huge congratulations to our, our student artists, and I'd, I'd like to name them that we have Rihanna Antone, Antone, who has a silver key, Cedar Clough, silver, Hannah Cronin, gold, Iris Fitzpatrick, gold, Jack Friedman, honorable mention, Finn Fertney, uh, three gold keys, two silver keys, and two honorable mentions. Jack Gilbert, honorable mention. Cormac Hluska, gold key, two silver keys, and two honorable mentions. Bray Hodgson, three silver keys. Minka Holtrop, gold key, and five honorable mentions. Mia Hornschild Bear, three gold keys, four silver keys, and six honorable mentions. Olivia Landburn, gold key, silver key, honorable mention. Megan Randall, honorable mention. Katie Roy, honorable mention, two of those. Jennifer Shaper, two honorable mentions. Tegan Sloan, two silver keys. Jaden Stoltz, honorable mention. Kendall Thibodeau, honorable mention, two of those. Lily West, gold key and two honorable mentions. Jillian Wright, American Visions nominee, three gold keys, three silver keys, and six honorable mentions. And Hallie York, gold key and two honorable mentions. This is certainly a testament to our fabulous students, and our, our visual arts teachers in the programs at RSU 5, because certainly um, these, these students have worked very hard, and it doesn't just happen at, at high school. It starts when they're in kindergarten. So congratulations. I have a few resignations to announce this evening. Um, Katie Beiser, Adult Education Coordinator, Ray Susi, Custodian, Jamie Palanza, Food Service Assistant, and Christy McDonald, Mass Landing School SEM teacher. She will resign at the end of the year. And that's my entire report tonight. Those are some prolific artists. My goodness. Good for them. Um, do we know, I know in the past they have posted the pictures that have gotten the silver and the gold key. And is there, do we know if there's a website we could see on that? We'll have to ask Jen. Oh, Piper might know. I know they were sent out to students, so there exists a compilation of them, but I'm not sure if there's like a link or something that you can access. Oh, nice. Cool. Thank you. All right. Um, so we will move on to administrator reports, and I think we only have one this evening. Peggy, finance. thing I wanted to update originally it showed that there was 42% of our revenues received even though we had 50% of the year gone the fiscal year gone um, however the Freeport um, funds had been received they just had not been posted so not to worry they're all posted now and um, as I reported out to the Finance Committee so therefore we are at 47% of our revenues received and um, and 30% of our budget had been spent by the end of December. And Beth has the full report for later. Any questions for Peggy? Thank you. Thank you. All right, so we will move on to item 10 on the agenda, which is board comments and committee reports. Um, so A is board information exchange and agenda requests. And I'll just remind folks that um, this is also an opportunity, even if your particular committee isn't called out here in B through D, if you're on a committee and wanted to share some of the work that's going on there or um, any other updates, here's an opportunity to do that. Patty. It's just a little thing, but I love it when we get informed from teachers and principals about stuff going on in the school. So like the email that the high school got with all those pictures, it's easy to just put the board email on there too. Please, please include us. I love it when we're invited to plays and concerts and when Craig lets us know about athletic things happening. So that's just my request to the staff in general. Maura. 
I have a couple of MSBA related updates. Um, we recently had our regional meeting with the other uh, board members from around our region in Cumberland County. Uh, that was a nice chance to connect with folks and hear you know, challenges that they're facing and also successes. Um, I believe it is available to board members if you couldn't attend and you would like to watch it. Or I also took some notes, which I didn't bring with me if you wanna know more about what happened there. Um, and also you may have seen you get all um, kind of uh, a lot of emails inviting you to all the regional meetings. I don't know if you get those as well as me, but um, okay, maybe just I get them. Other, if you ever want to go to another regional meeting because you can't make ours, you're welcome to go to any of the other ones too. So I can, you can always ask me and I can let you know when they are. Um, so that was a really great um, meeting just to share with other board members. And then we also had our monthly MSBA meeting where we um, had a chance to meet with Commissioner Macon and ask some questions, and that was a great opportunity. And um, it's always nice to hear from her. She's just so supportive of public education and positive. She's really um, wonderful. And we also got our first update about um, bills this session, and it's quite lengthy, so I won't go through it, but um, there wasn't anything that specifically raised my interest, but th a list of those is available online as well, and I can share that with the board. Um, usually if there were anything that I thought would be of particular interest, I would bring it to you and share it with you, but, um, I don't have anything at this time. So, and then I, I had one more thing. Um, I just wanted to make an agenda request. I would be interested in the future to hear more about the board's involvement in curriculum. So maybe even for like a workshop next year to discuss, like I know some boards have curriculum committees and take different roles, uh, I know it's probably, you know, depending on how hands-on the board wants to be versus how um, how many updates we we have just would be interesting to talk about. I know we get updates from Cynthia, which are always very informative, but just something I'd like to consider and maybe talk about, I'd be interested in exploring further. Yeah. I would second that uh, desire to be uh, more informed on curriculum updates or have the opportunity to be more involved in that process. Uh, and I also wanted to give some updates from Meeting House Arts. And uh, speaking of all the wonderful artists in our schools here, we uh, March is Youth Art Month. And the last week in March, there will be a youth art gallery show. So there will be some more information that will be put out um, for a call for submissions and for, for art to be submitted. So stay tuned for that info. Uh, and Meeting House Arts also brought on a new board member who happens to be a high school student here, Logan Schultz. Uh, so that's really exciting for Meeting House Arts and, and we're doing, we're really excited to be bridging, um, connecting more with, the, with all of the schools in the district. And if there's anyone in the school systems who want to be more a part of, um, of that process and let me know. Thank you. Any other comments, questions, committee reports? Yeah, Kelly. I sit on the board of the Freeport Conservation Trust <clears throat> and it just came up this, this last week that they are looking for high schoolers to get involved over there for some small projects and so I was going to be speaking with Carrie about hooking up with the appropriate people over here to make that happen. Do you need direction on who those appropriate people are? Or are, you, are you? If you'd like to share that right now, <laughs> that would be fine. I mean, I guess my thought, and correct me if I'm wrong, Jean, would be Jen. At, at Start with Jen. Yeah, yeah, I figured it would. And it then would be it where probably ends up with Dee Dee Bunnell. Yeah. Um, okay. Who sort of corrals all of the volunteer opportunities for the students and, and sort of uh, collaborative works that are going on in the community, but I'd probably start with Jen. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, I also wanted to add that I think it's the Freeport Sustainability Board that has a workshop coming up about the impact of sea level rises in Freeport, and I noticed when I was reading the, um, the rating uh, SP Global Rating that they refer to environmental conditions and uh, it made and I happened to just see that workshop on the impact of sea level rise and weather events and it's February 6th at 6 30 p.m. at the Freeport Community Services if anyone's interested in learning more about that. All right.
You good, Candy? I guess. Is your mic on? Yeah. Is that okay? Oh, oh, you're moving on. Okay. Yeah. I just didn't know if you still had one on. You had something else you wanted to share before we jumped to strategic oh, no. communications. <laughs> no. Are you doing strategic communications yeah. tonight? All right. Carry on. Okay. Um, well, unfortunately, you don't all have a copy of this. You might at home or it's online. The committee worked on two things, reviewing the budget brochure and looking at the staff satisfaction survey. And you can see here in the notes, it takes you kind of page by page through the budget brochure about the changes we made. Um, you know, I'll do a brief kind of talk about it, but you really might want to look at it at home, but it's not a big deal. Um, the old brochure just has a picture of a couple little kids there. We're going to put the, um, the RSU5 logo on the cover. Um, and there are a couple little pictures in there that are not very good at all, so we're taking those out. Um, on page two, we will be updating the community um, data, the, uh, population, median age, percent, 65 and over, that all the data, we will be updating that. The page that's the points of pride, we will be adding the early intervention team. That's some, you know, a little blurb about, about them to the points of pride. And um, <laughs> when it lists the board's strategic goals, as you go through them, it, talk, it calls them objectives. They needed to be called goals. So that's what that's about. We'll change that. And um, page three and four, there's school and enrollment data and um, achievement information. Nope, I, I'm sorry, I've got the wrong things. There's the points of pride and then the thing about the goals. We'll be switching those pages just so that the goals come first. Not a real big deal, but those will be switched. And um, then we will do the, um, you know, the uh, charts again with the um, enrollment and whatnot. Um, and the, the pre-K through eight be anticipated, be called anticipated class size per grade and um, moving paragraphs on page six. So it's just the, um, the, the uh, charts. And um, could you just tell us what's on page six? Yeah, page six is achievement information from NWEA. Yep. So what large paragraphs are you well, removing from the charts? Well, there are paragraphs um, kind of explaining what it is, and I thought the paragraphs needed to come out. The charts just needed to be there. Okay. That's what that is. Um, and you can find it on page, uh, page 7. Um, we were going to... I'm not sure what we were going to change it to, but where the boxes for the free slash reduced school lunch eligibility, we said we were going to change that header to make it clearer. I'm not sure. I don't remember what the header, what we were going to change it to. Does anybody remember? <laughs> I don't remember specifically, but in general, a lot of these changes are, are to try to not use so much sort of administration-specific lingo and use language that might be more generally understandable to our, to our public. And then, like, the paragraph I think that Candy was mentioning was, like, the, you know, the detail under a graph yeah. that gets real granular. And, but meanwhile, you couldn't really see the graph because of the size, so we just wanted to boost that and, and change the headings to make it a little bit more clear what people are looking at. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> on, excuse me, on page seven, it has the subsidy information. And um, we were gonna try to make that a little clearer. And the other thing is on page eight, well, since, since we're consolidating things and whatnot, um, if possible, we might make the warrant articles and the budget process two different pages rather than have them on one page. So you might you can look at it online or if you still have it from last year at home with this list. <laughs> um, 
And the other thing was the staff satisfaction survey, which is pretty simple and straightforward. There'll be a there'll be a drop down men, menu that will be a little more inclusive about who's answering the the survey, and um, ask them if they've got any suggestions beyond their prior feedback. And the B team is going to look at it. That's it. <laughs> Jen. Um, I just have a couple of questions, Candy. Yes. Um, for the budget brochure, I think all the changes you talked about are great. I think that this is a really good opportunity that we get to share info when that goes, because that goes out to everyone right. in the RSU. So I had a question about the early intervention team points of pride. So is that like kind of like a highlight something from the previous budget that we're to update and let people know like what impact that had? Because I think that's a great opportunity to highlight previous budget, you know, yeah. expenses that we, you know, are proud of and think have really made a huge... But it, that's not necessarily on that page budget information. That page has little blurbs about athletics, the middle school, Pownall, Mass Landing, Morris, Durham, Freeport High School, and district-wide. So it's little okay. blurbs about each one of those things describe, you know, what they are. Okay, so but the ad, you're adding the early intervention yes. team. Okay, the other thing too is that as far as the change in the you talked about the free and reduced information. So I know that we talked about that at one meeting a while back about how like we really need to continue to push that because it really isn't just about free and reduced lunch. It's about all all kinds of other things come with that, like for for the school system. So maybe an opportunity to add something about that, or maybe Aaron can speak to that. I'm not sure, Jean, you add something about how the free and reduced lunch, like, it all, I almost feel like it needs to get changed to something else, like free reduced lunch and, like, tons of great programs or something. So people fill it out. So maybe just some clarification on what that brings to the RSU when people do fill that out. The struggle okay. is is the, um, the budget brochure is – Pretty much a finite number of pages right. based on right. printing, right? right. So um, you know the the struggle is is really to put anything new in. We have to take something out, right? I, I want to say the the header they're talking about, and it's hard because we we don't have it in front of us to look right. at. But um, what they're talking about is just the title of percentages, probably of people in the district. I mean, I 100% agree with you. Like people need to understand, and this would be an, a a great opportunity to to lay it out there that you know I I agree that the federal government needs to change the name of the program <laughs> right. because everybody has free and reduced lunch in Maine any, now. Um, but um, the problem is that is sort of the name of the program. Um, and it's national. Yeah. So yeah. Make it our yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, we'll see what we can do if there's some way to clarify anything there. Yeah. Just going to say that we had a lot of discussion around that actually, and I think Jean took some great notes and, and talked about wanting to um, come up with some wording to clarify that better and and to um, emphasize what was passed last year and how that is supported. So to your first point, we'd, we did talk about that, and I think Jean is prepared to make that more clear. I think that's a great opportunity because I think people forget and they don't remember, and so it's really nice to add that. Um, you know, and the other thing, too, just, like, as far as a brochure goes, I know it's online, but, like, I, I tend to, like, read everything that comes in the mail. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, sit, I think you're like, the through. minority, Jen. I'm sure I am. I mean, here's my date book, right, that I still use a pen with. I'm but, with you, Jen. Yeah, I mean, so we might be a dying breed but we still are around so um so yeah yeah so I just think like I I still like the idea of having it sent out there and I think it does reach another population I will say it is in the budget we do still send it out <laughs> yep uh, another thing we were trying to do to consolidate a little bit was to add QR codes for people to learn more about different pieces. Right. And I liked, I was thinking about it through the lens of like a kindergarten or pre-K family who has, they're entering public school for the first time and they don't know what any of this means. So how can we, how can we word it that way? And that would be helpful for any, even if, even for parents of high school students who have been through the school system to just understand what free and reduced lunch means now. And right. What's different, right? What's changed, yeah. Mara. Thank you for reviewing this. Um, are you looking for board feedback? It kind of sounded like we could look at this and then suggest additional changes. 
We we if if there are some changes, it, it needs to become pretty quickly because actually, as soon as we're on a really tight timeline, because we send them to the, the to to be printed, um, and actually the the bones have already been sent out to all the principals, and they're already beginning to work on their 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 portions of that. And Ginny is looking to make some of these changes, so there's something um, we're going to do is everything we can. We need to know pretty soon, actually, because it sounds like it's far away, but it's really not. But if you have something, send it quick. I might also um, make the request that the Finance Committee take a look at it at our next Finance Committee meeting, just because it is the budget brochure, and it's an opportunity to highlight a lot of things in the district around like class sizes and those sort of things, but um, I think we want to make sure that it's doing the job of of the budget piece really well um, and I know in the past we've talked about like oh why isn't the finance committee ever sort of look at that or weigh in ahead of time and usually it's like oh because it's already sense. gone to the printer um, so maybe we can add that to our February which it's next Wednesday right is our finance committee meeting first first Wednesday of the month I'm gonna look to Peggy because I do not know <laughs> it's usually the first right yeah Okay, perfect. So that if we have any changes or suggestions, not changes, but suggestions, we'll yeah. get them to you quick. Uh, and just for the benefit maybe of the public, when does it go out? When should they look for it in the mail? I mean, it comes out. It actually arrives not long before. That's the time crunch. So we can't send it out until we've adopted the budget. Right. Um, and then it takes a period of time to be printed and, and proofed and all those sort of things. Usually it's coming in people's mailbox the week before, um, the, like the couple weeks before the three town meeting. Sometimes they'll have it in their hand, um, for the, in the budget meetings we do in each town, like a Kate, like usually panel panels first, usually they haven't gotten it yet. Um, Freeport tends to get it first because it goes out at the Freeport um, post office. So usually, I'm going to say end of April, beginning of May. Is that right? Does that sound right? Yeah. If there's real specific feedback for this year, yeah, we have the time crunch. But if there's general feedback, I mean, this is our biggest opportunity to talk about what's happening in the district to the entire right. population. So so please don't re reserve your feedback because you know, share it with the committee and they can keep in, keep it in mind for next year because we started this, this year. Well, actually, I think the last meeting of last year we were talking about feedback. So, um, yeah. Bring it on. <laughs> She's going to regret those words. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> All right. Um, any other comments, questions on strategic communications? All right, we'll move on to Beth with finance. All right. Um, we've had a couple of meetings, so I'll be reporting on the December 14th meeting first. Um, Peggy updated us with the property and casualty questions that we had had about the increase. And um, due to a couple little things, we discovered that it um, was truly just a 19% just but it was a 19% increase over last year's bill. A um, couple other little things, this um, S&P rating, which uh, Kara already um, mentioned, I wanted to highlight just a couple of things because I think it's really interesting and you guys probably all read through this and know it all. Um, but the, uh, they, they downgraded our rating and the reason that they downgraded our rating is because we're trying to lower our unassigned fund balance to the 3% minimum uh, maximum that the state uh, requires. And so it felt a little odd because we feel like we're doing what we should be doing and lowering um, our reserves a bit. And also, um, I liked that the sentence, and I just wanted to read this aloud, that um, <laughs> with, a, with their summary on the credit overview, it says, we understand the district intends to lower reserves and ultimately the cost to taxpayers in the next several fiscal years. So I just want everybody to understand that we really do try to keep that in mind. Um, and one other highlight was just that they um, said that we include a conservative budgeting approach rooted in three to five years of historical trends for variable costs. Um, and that's on page four, if anybody was wanted to know. So it was um, very interesting for me. I hadn't seen the report before, so um, I was 
happy to learn about that. Um, if does anybody have any questions about that? Or, yeah, Kara. So we went from A plus to A A minus. What what is what are what's the range here? <laughs> How many A's are there? <laughs> that is a good question. I yeah know? I do not know. Do you know Michelle? Off the top of my head, no. I I feel like you can go to triple A before you drop to B, um, but don't but don't. Can I? Yeah, no. <laughs> can I ask you a question about that? Because my I I read it differently is that we dropped from double A minus to A plus. So A A double A minus seems to be a higher rating uh, than. I just don't really understand. Can you just explain to me what the implications of this little decrease actually are? Um, there aren't any immediate impacts right now because our, our debt, and I'm looking at Peggy to shake her head if I say something incorrect, is, is currently fixed, right? Where it would impact is if we had to go back out to the market today, and in, in addition to the fact that interest rates are significantly higher today than they were the last time we took out debt, which was for um, the high school um, renovation, uh, so in addition to the fact that interest rates are higher, your interest rate is driven by your bond rating. Like how, so the better your bond rating, the lower your interest rate is. So kind of think of it like a credit score. Um, and so this, this little difference that we just experienced here. It doesn't impact any of our existing debt because it, it would only impact us, my understanding, is if we went back out and tried to borrow money today it might be at a slightly higher rate. I mean, it would be at a higher rate just because rates are higher in general, but it would be at a slightly higher rate than if we were still at AA minus. Does that sound right, Peggy? Okay. Colin. Yeah, I'm just, um, this was really helpful to, to dig into. I'm, I'm just trying to work my, my way through the, um, the first part of the credit overview of, uh, so it seems that this was driven by a stated intention by the district to reduce the reserve levels. Yes, I'm understanding that correctly. And that we're, and we're um, going from what they would understand to be strong to adequate. Um, and that has to do with the, uh, the state maximum. So I'm a little confused how we could lower something to a state maximum. So um, you want to take it? Oh, I can try. Go for it. Um, well, I... During COVID, they raised it to 9%, I think, right? The state? No. No? Uh, no. The state never oh. changed their maximum, I don't believe. Um, so basically it the says, state. It says it right here. Oh, maybe they did. I mean, <laughs> so we have, it's never been a maximum, right? The state has never said, like, you can't have more than this much money in your savings account. So what we're talking about here is the unexpended fund balance. So basically, funds we have collected through taxation over the year that we didn't end up spending for whatever reason, right? Turnover, savings, whatever. Um, so money that, that was assessed, collected, but not spent goes into that un unassigned uh, fund balance. And the state says that they don't want t uh, districts to maintain more than 3% of their total budget um, in their unassigned fund balances because they feel like they should be going back to the taxpayers, right? Mm -hmm. um, you don't want to be collecting more than you need. Um, and so what the state has said is the maximum is, is um, they say that if you have more than the maximum on hand, they could, could offset your subsidy, basically saying you don't need the state money. You've got enough in your savings account. Uh, my understanding is they have not ever done that. They have never offset somebody's um, subsidy for, for that reason. Um, and ours has sort of fluctuated through the years. Um, it's interesting that they raised it to nine because that's kind of the max of where ours has sat is in like the three to four million dollar range. Um, and we used it for the track and field instead of going out for a bond. We funded it out of unexpended fund balance. So, I mean, I don't think our plan was, I don't think our plan was ever to get right to the 3% because that feels a little bit tight. You know, basically we're looking at a million, million 250 on a $35 million budget. I mean, it's not a huge cushion. Um, so, you know, 
it's interesting that they state that we're we're bringing it down to the three percent because I don't think we've ever actually gotten it down to three percent. We've always historically been above that. And that's a that's a that determination for where we're going to set that level is made between the finance committee and the administration. It's really decided by the board um, because how much we leave in there is a function of how much we use in our budget to offset the increase in the upcoming budget. So when we say we're going to use a million dollars of unassigned fund balance, mm. that's where that figure comes into play. And so typically we'll have the conversation about where is it today? It's one of the reasons why having the audit in hand is so important because you don't really know what your, your unexpended fund balance is until the audit comes in and says, here it is. Um, and so we use that to say, okay, this is where it is. If we wanted to get to the 3%, we, you know, you could do it two ways. You could use it and say, we want it to be, we want our unexpended fund balance to be X and we're gonna put everything above X to reduce taxation. That's one way to do it. Or the other way is, okay, we want to sort of keep our taxation increases to a certain percent, and we're going to use enough of our fund balance to get us there. So it's... Okay, so the, when, uh, so just because budget season is coming up, um, or we're in the middle of it, but it will, it will, the most joyous part of it is, is coming. Um, one of the things we, we should be keeping an eye on is the decisions that are made about that budget in relationship to these numbers, right? And I guess we're we're hoping the finance committee will flag anything where we are we're making some drastic change regards to how we're doing in relationship to that three percent and its impact on the on the the credit profile. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't I don't anticipate the recommendation is. is I mean, I don't know. I can't speak for the board. My my personal opinion, or the finance committee, is that we wouldn't be recommending ever dropping below the three percent. Mm -hmm. They call it a maximum. In my mind, it's a minimum. Okay. I mean, I, I don't think we should be holding huge percentages, mm -hmm. but you know, this is really, it, this is what would if we had to, if for whatever reason the state had to do a curtailment, right? And Jean's been in education a long time. She's I'm sure dealt with them, right? Which uh, basically a curtailment is. In March, the state says, nobody's getting any more subsidy. We're cutting it off. And we're like, well, we had planned on that subsidy, and now we don't have enough to pay for everything, potentially. And so then there has to be an emergency vote to access those funds, or you have to make immediate cuts on the spot, right? And it hasn't happened in a long time, but it has happened since I've been on the board 10 years. Um, so that's one of the reasons we, you know, we want to maintain that cushion and not put it all towards reducing taxation in a given year. But yeah, I think you would hear from. Cool. You would no, hear I, from I would. I would expect so. I'm just tr trying to wrap my head around it. My only other question just was about the second sentence, where it says the district's net performance was negative, uh, with expenses outpacing revenues from fiscal years 2017 to 2019, um, and then it says in part due to subsidy transfers, the school nutrition fund, and an overassessment of the member towns. Um, what's going on with that? That was a mistake, right? The overassessment. Of the towns was that the one where we had to give the money back yes i imagine i, I imagine that well I'll, i guess i'll look to gene and peggy they met with the the folks that did this report i don't know if they mentioned specifically what that was i mean the over assessment that's that was probably the, what was it like 300 and change thousand dollars that got assessed because there was an inaccuracy in the warrants that got approved at the annual budget meeting um in terms of expenses outpacing revenues i mean actually i would i would argue it was the other way around in the over assessment of the towns we took in too much revenue and didn't have expenses to to pay um which is why we gave it back to the towns but um i don't know did they have anything specific to say around that yeah they, they did say a lot about that the the what we walked away with at the end was the big reason it dropped was was that we use some of your unassigned fund balance toward and you, you're bringing that down, which is good for the taxpayers. It's the fiscally responsible thing to do to the taxpayers. But when you're looking to borrow money, they look at that unfavorably. But that, that was what he, that's really when we met with him, that was the primary emphasis on what happened there. And he did not spend a lot of, they did not spend a lot of time going over every detail of the report. They gathered, gathered information. 
and then report it out. So I don't, unfortunately, I don't have any other information on that. No, I guess I was just I was curious with. I mean, so it seems like you're saying that our the fact that our 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 quote net performance end quote was negative is not actually negative in terms of the sort of overall sort of health of the district. It's just that has to do with what, uh, in terms of our capacity for going back on the market, as Michelle was speaking about earlier. I, yeah, I would, I would say that's a fair assessment. And then the other piece was around the nutrition plan. So the nutrition plan had historically, and it's not uncommon, we're not unique in the fact that the nutrition programs have historically um, been not cost uh, yeah, they, they generally operate in the red, um, and the district had sort of funded that gap. Um, but I will shout out to Aaron. The last couple of years, it has been it has been cost neutral or in the positive. So, um, so that's great news. Um, so it could be just the point in time, because um, seventeen to nineteen, we were probably funding those losses still. Um, great, thank you. That is so helpful. Any other questions? All right, we'll move on to the uh, next one. Is January 11th, they have the minutes from. Um, and just a couple of things, obviously you can read through. Um, we are still having um, trouble getting the audit completed due to several reasons and we're, um, they've, uh, We've gotten an extension to the end of February, I believe. Is that what it is now? Okay. And um, so hopefully it will all be getting together then. And um, Peggy and Jean are just watching the financials closely in Article 8 because um, with the shortages of the bus drivers, one of the staff position who's a mechanic for the buses has been having to drive the buses, so we're having to outsource the mechanic work. So it's bit more costly than planned on um, and yeah that was about all the little highlights but if anybody has any other questions on it I'm happy or Michelle can answer too and Maura <laughs> oh that's right Maura because you had a I was just gonna also talk about the Pender Mink and when you um, saw her because we were asking a question about because if the audit gets extended too far it can potentially impact subsidy but and pender said that they weren't going to be doing that correct okay yes so that was just an extra thing i wanted to share thank you <laughs> yeah yeah the doe builds in some you know outs where if you do this they they could cut your your subsidy everything we've ever dealt with them that's not their goal um but you know they're in there if they needed to use them call Beth, not uh, needing to get too much in the weeds, but is the, the the problems with the audit situation, is that a sort of acute kind of now problem, or is it more of a the way our, the RSU is handling that process and we will keep recurring as a problem each year? It, um, yeah, it's not yeah, our problem. Sorry. Yeah, no, it's not. It, it's, <laughs> I mean, it is it's our not, problem. It's, it's <laughs> the audit. It's the auditor. It's not it's the RSU. It's problem. We're, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it becomes our problem when we have to ask for extensions so. we good Colin anything else okay all right I of course have lost my agenda <laughs> policy there we go I guess I just look at the next page in my, my thing so the policy committee actually met today um, we had an extra meeting today to work exclusively on our new um, transgender and gender expansive students uh, policy that we are writing from a template we got from from our um, our lawyers um, and MSBA. Sorry, from MSBA with l legal input. MSMA. Good lord, <laughs> Just keep correcting me. Um, so we met today, and, we're, and our next meeting is on the 3rd of February, and we will continue that work. Um, this was our second meeting on it today. We have had input from the DEI committee. We've had input from students. Uh, we're grateful that Dr. Sellers has been joining our meetings and helping as well. Um, and we want you all to know that, that we're also going to run this past our legal team as well before we bring it to you. So we're going to subjected to lots of good legal scrutiny before you guys get to play with it. Um, 
And today we're bringing we're bringing four policies for you. We'll have second read on the um, the program for English language learners and the and the plan for that. And that was just dealing with some mostly language <coughs> changes, new acronyms, changes in that work. Um, and then our first reads today are IHBAC Child Find and JRA Student Records and Information. Um, with the Child Find, that's pertaining mostly to changes in the law. You'll see at the beginning there we have language that says up to school age because the way that it was previous, the way the language that they used to describe what school age is was really confusing. And so we just simplified it so it's more understandable for everybody. And we, um, we reordered, uh, Colin's really great at making sure that when you read a policy that people can say like, oh, the beginning say, sentence should say, why do we have a policy? And then we should describe what the policy is going to be about, and then we get into the weeds. That's not always the case with all our policies, so that's what we're attempting to do here is just reorder things, make them clear, um, and we added language around COVID as well. And then with the student records and information, we removed the reference to wait because that is not information that we need to keep on hand. And, um, and we had a fun little debate about whether articulable was a real word or not, <laughs> depending on whose dictionary or grandparents' dictionary or whatever you have in your living room or on your computer, it is or it is not. So anyway, we changed it. Um, yeah. Can we, we take a, a poll of, of who has a dictionary in their living room? No, oh, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> she has her day planner. I have a dictionary. <laughs> Did not expect Peggy's hand to go up. <laughs> So I don't know if anyone wants to ask questions about the meetings in, in general before we go into the policies. I have a question, but it's about the, a policy. Do you want me to wait? Do you want to do the motion for or Sure. All right, so we'll start with the first reads. So do I have a motion for consideration and approval for first read of the following policies, IHBAC, Child Find, and JRA, Student Education Records and Information. Kara and Kelly, thank you. So my question is on the Child Find, which I'm, I'm actually like reading through trying to figure out why it's called Child Find, um, which is confusing to me. but. The first, pair, the first sentence says, RC5 seeks to ensure that all children within its jur jurisdiction who are school-aged and who are in need of special education supportive assistance, what? Yeah, I forgot. We need the word R. So if you skip down, and I meant to tell you that, Cynthia, but skip down to where, whatever, line six or seven, where it says identified, it should say R, identified, located, like and evaluated. Oh, yeah. okay. that makes more sense. We focused on the big important words. Sometimes we leave out the little ones. Okay. So that answers the question about Colin's idea of stating why we have a policy. So that makes sense. Thank you. Um, can you just share how these children are identified? And how they're located. I don't know. I couldn't find that information in here, and I don't know. I read it a few times. I may have missed it. But how are they identified? I mean, I'm seeing where they would be identified, but what is that process exactly? Dr. Sellers could best answer that for the board. Okay, so you're not going out and connecting with correctional facilities and saying, do you have any students in the RSU who are in our district who would benefit from schooling or any of these other locations that are, it's not like we're not going out and actively finding children. Is that accurate? So, or? well, we, would be, we, we could be serving students that are in those settings, students that are under the responsibility of the school district as a local educational authority. 
So, I mean, we don't have people, you know, go actively going out. But if, if there was, if there was a need and if it came to our attention, we would be responsible for evaluating those students. If there was a suspected disability for a student that was under the, you know, the educational purview of RSU 5, then we would be responsible for going out and evaluating that student. So this is not kids that are currently in our schools. It is it is students that are currently in our schools. Yes. Yes, all children. So what's that the are goal under of the this? educational jurisdiction? So child find it's a federal regulation and what it says that if we have any knowledge or suspicion that a student may have a disability, it's our responsibility to evaluate that student in all suspected areas of disability. Oh, see, I was, I guess I completely misunderstood. I thought this was like, if we have homeless kids living in our, we need to make, find a way to get them to school, regardless of disability. I was thinking special education and, or maybe I was thinking, or supportive assistance. Like, so, okay, thank you for the clarification. Jen. Not that you'd remember it, but what you just said is, I think, a great uh, point to put in the policy. Like what June just stated about child find is a national, like that tells me what you're talking about, where I did not find that in here. I agree with Kara. Like it's, it, it's like, I think it needs a tiny bit of more information, kind of like what you just shared, June, about, about what it means. Cause I, I mean, I, I, child find is kind of a, it's very confusing to me. Right. Like what so, that means. So I think there was originally some consideration for putting that language in. So, I mean, I think the policy committee could yeah. consider yeah yeah just adding a little piece like what you just said right because <laughs> i mean it definitely is a misnomer right like it's kind of like free and reduced lunch right uh, right uh, this, this, child this, find this is sort of like an obscure this, you know right this title. to me is like hide and seek right I that's agree. what child find is to me <laughs> i mean it doesn't doesn't scream like kids that need special education I, services and I, I agree If you read it and don't read all the struck through th stuff, it makes, a, it makes more sense. Yeah. RSU number five seeks to ensure that all children within its jurisdiction who are school age and who are in need of special education and supportive assistance are identified, located, and evaluated. And then it goes on to define what it is. An effective child find system is an ongoing part of our responsibility to ensure that a free and appropriate public education is made available to all eligible children with disabilities. So I think it actually does that. I think maybe if it was flipped, I guess, is what, I don't know, I just I just liked what Ju when June started it that way. That's just my personal. Right, when you meet, read it la that way, Maddie, which I thank you for that. <laughs> it's hard to read it like that when there's like the big piece in the middle, but but I like that the that last sentence actually says like it's our responsibility because of this that then we're going to seek to ensure all children. That's just I, I do I do agree. I think if we flip those two sentences, it would it would read more clearly. Yeah, and I think that adding just that it is the fed that part of the federal uh, it's the fulfillment of a federal requirement, which is uh under free and appropriate public like that is fits within that but i think that could be clarified and just in general we do tend to like to go with the way dr seller says things because they're always providing things that are better said than the way we have them i think you said at the outset this was the one that had the changes that were made because the law changed is that right or was that a different policy so it's not necessarily that the law changed but there was an update to add some COVID language in there. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I see that. And then I also see the struck part says children who are school age 5 through 20. Is that put someplace else in here? Is that still a put? That's well, so I, I think that's where it started to get really convoluted in, in terms of just like wordsmithing that. So the committee agreed to change it to school age because school age refers to every student that's under the purview of RSU 5. So there's not a specific age required by the federal law? No, if they're okay. school age. School age, I believe, is what the what is included in the regulation. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I think what you were saying, if you can explain somewhere, too, that there are current, 
current students that are already enrolled in the school. I guess I got stuck on the part where it says it also includes students who reside in nursing homes and those in correctional facilities. So I, that's what I was picturing people. And then it's called Child Find. So I'm like, they're here. We don't need to go find them if they're already here. Right. So it's a little confusing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess I'm also confused about the fact that children who are parentally placed in private schools are under this law. Like, yes, how does correct. that... If that's they're... correct. So, so all of the private schools that are that are in the Freeport area. So we are responsible for the identification of students with disabilities who attend those schools. And is that a parental per responsibility then to bring those children to the attention of the RSU five? Because otherwise, how, how would, would they? Know? Yeah. So it could be that a school administration it could be school staff in those private schools, or it could be a parent and we do evaluate those students. Because I know we do provide like speech yes. services for kids who go to private schools. Correct. Right. Yeah. If the parent wants them. Right. I'm just curious if parents in private schools are aware of this. They are. They should be anyway. They should be. Probably are because most of the private schools aren't equipped to deal with these things. So I right. imagine their administrators are saying, well, turning them right back around to right. Dr. Sellers. That's and generally yeah. what happens. Any other questions on Child Find? And I understand that's the, the federal name. I'm not <laughs> saying we should change it. I'm just Kara. Um, I just wonder, if, uh, it says English learners in here, and I don't know if we want to change that to multilingual learners since that's the language we're using in the other policies. But is that specifically out of the, oh, is the, that law? the law language? Uh, the third, third paragraph. In the big ad, according to state law. Yeah, I believe that is. Okay. It's not it in quotes. Stay. Just in the third paragraph. Yeah, if it says state, where they need to say that if it's that if it says federal, then we have to go with that. I don't have I gave mine to Bruce, I don't have one right there. Oh. But if it says state in there, then it is. It does say state. state. And just in the first paragraph, when you added that last sentence, child find, it looks like you're trying to capitalize C and F. Just in the in the final there. in the final sentence, it says an effective child find, but it's lowercase C and lowercase F, and everywhere else, it's uppercase C and uppercase F. Yeah. yeah, since we're getting into the weeds, there's also a sentence that's repeated in third paragraph. It is all. It also includes children who have complex mental medical needs, et cetera. We just like that sentence so much. We just wanted to repeat it. Although although it's interesting because the law reference is different. 300.8B and 300.111B through C. But everything. That's a different That's sentence. It also includes, oh, you're right, right, OK. Yeah, that one was before the sentence they put in twice. Yeah, the reference is only in there once. Any other comments on this one before we jump to the second one? All right. So literally, we just changed one word on this one? Two. Two. Articulable, too specific. And loop. Yeah. Like a loop. I did notice that articulable is there twice. It's, a, it's like two lines above, and we missed that. So I don't know if we want to change yes. that to specific <laughs> as well. <laughs> you only removed it because you didn't want to be like redundant. You yeah. still like the word? Yeah, maybe that was it. <laughs> articulable. Trying to win the dictionary fight. Yeah. <laughs> like, is, does it just mean something you can articulate? Yeah. Articulatable? Yeah. I think I like that word better. <laughs> and then um, the, so, and height versus height and weight of students. So that was the only other change.
do they really track the height of suits? Well, basketball, you know, a lot of it's athletic, Sports. right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you're playing basketball, they might want to have a height. Then you do inflate them. They're just collected by kids to see how you know how much you <laughs> or, or they measure them. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The information is collected by college recruiters, et cetera. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. All right. Any comments on that one? <laughs> All right, so we have a motion. We have a second. Doesn't sound like there's any more discussion. Are we ready for votes? All those in favor? None opposed. Great. Uh, all right, so do I have a motion for consideration and approval of s second read for the following policies? IHBEA, Program for Multilingual Learners, old title, Program for English, English Language Learners, and IHBEAR, the LAU plan. Maddie and Maura, thank you. I don't think we had any changes since our first read to this, did we, Cynthia? Yeah. So no substantive changes from the last time we read it. All right. Yeah. yeah. I so appreciate the second reads. So I apologize if I'm going to have a, a number of things. Um, with the program for multilingual learners, I noticed in the first sentence it talks about um, students for whom English is a new or second language. And I don't know if we want to just take, I mean, it could be their third or fourth language. And if the idea of multilingual is the idea that they could have multiple languages that they're aware of? So know. we could simply just Take remove, a or a second, we could just say a new language. New language. Yeah. No. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Good catch. Could you tell me what was the first sentence of the, of the policy? Mm -hmm. Just removing the words or second. So you're saying for whom English is a new language. Was that always the case, though, right? Like, so if you had sort of a, a dual language household where the kids may have grown up here, but their household is, it might not be new is what I'm saying, right? Like we could have secondary, secondary or potentially or additional, additional language. Maddie, I remember us talking about this issue and catching it. Maybe it was caught, we caught it elsewhere. I remember we talking about. We caught it at the beginning, but this list is wrong. Okay. What'd you change it to? No, we were trying to address the fact that there there are probably cur uh, students currently enrolled who speak th four or five languages, right. um, and tr trying to address. So that was um, moving away from se uh, uh, second a second language. Yeah. But I think yes, it does. We have to f I, we have maybe have to think about that. Of what that should really say a new language. I don't know. There's also in part A, it says how students will be identified as being from a non-English language background. So that could be the wording used in the first sentence as well. So yes, I think that's an awesome way to do it. So the Board of Directors recognizes that there may be students attending RSU5 schools for whom, who are from a non-English language background. No, that could be true, right? Right. right that's oh. what I think it's that's not their important. first line map, but it, it doesn't right. limit them to where they are in the line, where English is in this in the line. I think the um, is it Lao or L A U? How do we it's pronounce Lau. it? Lao. Oh, okay. So D all capitalized. Okay. It is. It's a person. I feel like it's addressed in that one more often, where it's just saying um, speakers of other languages, in order to provide English for speakers of other languages. I think is how that is referred to. That it, um, English as a second language was um, struck out, and speakers of other languages was added, replaced. Uh -huh. 
who who are speakers of another. Mm. I think the correction you have gets to what we what we the last one suggested is is good. For whom English is not their first. Mm. No, that's not good. Never mind. There. Yep, so that's I've got the first sentence all squared, and where are you now? So we're talking about the first sentence. What do you okay. have? So the board of directors recognizes that there may be some students attending other community college schools for whom English is not their first language. I, think I don't really think that captures the fact that it, it might still be very familiar to them, even if it's not their first language. I really like the fact that it's saying it's new to them. It's something they're still working on. But it might not be new. Right. So, right. I'm saying that, but I don't like that. I, uh, I, I don't think that it's if not being their first language captures the fact that it's they're learning it is what I'm trying to say, I guess. Mm. Well, no, I think the second, se second sentence would pick up where you're going, though. Like, for whom English is not their first language, these students may be significantly challenged as they acquire or improve English proficiency. So that kind of highlights... The, the, the concern of why we have a policy to support them, right? And if I can add, there are some students we have that don't require any special programming as well, even though English is, is, um, was not their first language. And because um, there, there, there are little ones that, and there are older kids that require services and allow plan, but there are other kids that have taken the WIDA assessment and they've tested out and they're very proficient in reading and writing and speaking English. But I think that's why it says maybe significantly challenged, right? So it doesn't say they all are and they all need support. It's just saying if English is not their first language, this may be something that they're facing and here's our plan to help them. Would primary capture it better? They're, they're, it's not their primary language? I'm just thinking because you know, being in Africa, there are lots of people who speak many languages and, you know, they're pretty good at, I guess I'm trying to say, is there some way of saying it's not their first language, but it's also not the one that they just, it's not one that they just think in, you know what I'm saying? First and primaries, I mean, both mean that, and I think it means both. Yeah, I guess it, I'm. I guess I'm going to the purpose of the policy. <laughs> like, what? Why do we have this policy? We have this policy because there are students who speak multiple languages, and we recognize that they may need support for. English specifically as one of those multiple languages, right? I mean, that's mm -hmm. the... Right. So it doesn't really have to do with new. It doesn't have to do with new. It doesn't have to do with second. It has to do with multiple languages. It has, has to do with multiple languages. And, and typically, if English was their first language and they, they also speak French and Spanish and German, then they wouldn't qualify here, right? So I think first picks up who we're trying to identify. I'm thinking about a totally different. I'm, I'm wondering if we want to do this a little differently and use the word fluency. I don't know if that gets us away from the intention of the policy. I feel like fluency is a specific set, you know, like it's a certain like a term. level mm -hmm. of Ability, maybe? I don't know. What if we said the Board of Directors recognizes that there may be some students attending RSU 5 schools who are acquiring or improving English proficiency? So kind of skipping right to that, if that's the idea that they're acquiring or improving proficiency and maybe experiencing challenges at the same time they're learning the knowledge and skills. I would say every kindergartner falls into that. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Or maybe every senior. <laughs> uh, Maura. Uh, just another vote for primary, I guess. I like that better than first. 
I think either is fine, but Jen. I, I, I think that either is fine, too. I just think that first and second language, like, I know that it might not be, like, exactly, but that, that's what we're used to hearing mm -hmm. versus primary. Like, I've never heard anyone say primary language. Well, maybe I have, but I hear people say first or second language more often. But, I mean, I, I really, I mean, I'd even go with what it originally said, so. Mara. I mean, not not to get too in the weeds, but the reason I was to elaborate on why I liked primary better is I just feel like it covers more circumstances. Um, but I think we could all sit here and think of like any circumstance forever that might not be covered in this policy. So I don't want to play that game, but um, that's what I was thinking. For whom English is not their primary language. Everybody okay with that? You good, Cynthia? Okay, so what we have come down on. Oh, you got something. Can I just the in the in the plan, which is the next document, the 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 um the very big be the beginning of the second paragraph is RSU number five does not discriminate against multilingual learners. Period. So I just wonder whether we should we should actually take that language and we should pull it into the first, you know, uh, so that it would say. Uh, where, where did it go? Um, the board of directors recognizes that there may be some students attending RSU number five schools who are, are multi-language multi learners. Yeah, these these students may because then that's keeping the whole the two things are related or interconnected with each other, and so therefore the logic is the same, and so the language should also be the same. We shouldn't be using primary or secondary if we then, within the actual plan, are getting rid of that language, which is what we sp specifically did. I, I basically agree with that. I think that I was just kind of feeling like the explanation of the English is new is sort of um, explaining what a multilingual learner is. So t for me to have it just kind of say, you know, boom, multilingual learners, but you know, I'm, I'm okay with it. I'm, you know. I am of the I am of the opinion that when you're going to uh, um, capitalize a term to make it essentially a defined term, we should have a definition of the term. So, so if it's you know for whom English is not their primary language, comma a multilingual learner, then you've identified it and we've said what they are, and this is who it applies to. I like that. So just that would that would mean that the Lao plan applies to everyone who would be considered a multilingual learner. Is that accurate? Uh, I think it applies. Well, it, yeah, it pops up in C out of yeah. nowhere. Right, the multilingual learners, right? Because the English language where previously was English language learners. So what do you think of that, Cynthia? So this is what I have. The board of directors recognizes that there may be some students attending RSU number five for whom English is not their primary language. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. If I'm reading June's face, does that work? Do you want to say it? Um, because the language in the, because it's all based on the student language survey. That's how we determine if there is a, a, a language student in the home. I'm just going to ask you to come to the mic just so people at home, sorry. All right. <laughs> So we were looking at the language in the home language survey, which is the survey that's given to all students to determine if there is a language other than English spoken in the home. So it uses the term primary home language. So I was just wondering if we shouldn't just put pri instead of primary, primary home language, oh. because that's the language that's in the actual survey that's sent out. And I also, I like that comma 
multilingual lingual learners because it makes ties it more cleanly to the Lao plan document and to the title of this one. <laughs> Back to Colin, like, what's the policy? I didn't we say have? we do it perfectly. I said it's what we try to do. But y'all are invited. This is what we do. This, this is all, this is policy committee stuff, y'all. So if, you know, this is you just get to get in it, get in, get into it. Then we talk about commas, all the good stuff. Yeah. Nope. Dick we talk about commas and periods in finance. They mean different things. Ooh, I like I like. That there's a little bit of competition emerging here. <laughs> All right. So, um, with that change, any other comments, questions on those two? Because this is a second read. So, if people are comfortable with just that change, when and we vote on it, it then becomes the plan. Oh, Kara's got more. On the Lao plan, part 1A, since DOE is referenced in the document as DOE, maybe we explain that, that after it says the main Department of Education, you put in parentheses DOE. Okay. Uh, and then further down, when it says WIDA, to define it there instead of on the next page. Um, in the bullets in, in that section bullets, 1A part 1A the second 1A. bullet we did it on the next it's on, there. It's on, on the, the next, next page, page in the bullets <laughs> under C because it should be the first time right yep. Yep. Um, you've all passed the test this is actually we left these errors in there intentionally <laughs> to see if if y'all were this is actually attention. policy recruiting night. <laughs> oh gosh, uh, and the and again, this is something I probably should have caught the first the first read. Uh, but the C and D. So there's the district language assessment committee, and then an RSU number five language assessment committee. And I consider RSU five our district, so that confused me a bit. And I wonder if it seems like the description of D language, the RSC5 is a school specific language assessment committee. So if, the, if C is district and then D, would it make sense to say a school language assessment committee is established at each school to coordinate and oversee the education program? And then where it says RSU number five again, it should just say school or school department, like what is, um, I just I want to know if that's, is, is that, that correct that though? accurate, right. So each of the schools in RSU5 has an LAC, and that is distinct from a the DLAC, which covers the entire RSU. Okay. I, I sort of feel like if you just took out RSU number five in the he heading on part D, it would be fairly clear that it was a school committee. Yep, yeah, I agree. Because then they want to make it a slack. Uh, but then in the... That at the end of that first sentence, maybe clarifying that they're overseeing the program in not the RSU five, but in the school, in that individual school. Yeah, I think it's established in each school to coordinate and oversee the educational program for the learners. I mean, you could probably could put a period there. Yeah. Or enrolled in that in that school. In the school in the RSU five schools, right? Because it's. But instead of it being in the RSU five schools, because that sounds more like district again, specifying that for that individual school, yeah, for each school. And then one more, just one more. Thing. Carry on. <laughs> uh, part three on page four, under at the end of A. The last sentence, the recommended configuration is the former, 
recommended by the Office for Civil of Civil Rights and the Maine Department of Education. I went down this rabbit hole of Googling Office of Civil Rights, and I was thinking it was a Maine department, but it's I think in here it's referring to the U.S. Office for Civil Rights. So I don't know if that would, I don't know if anyone would ever go down a rabbit hole like that. <laughs> uh, but I went down that rabbit hole and uh, found that. So we should change that to U.S. Office for Civil Rights. Yeah, and it's the, it's, which is under the U.S. Department of Education. So maybe even U.S. Department of Education Office for Civil Rights and the Maine Department of Education. If anyone else is wondering what the Office of Civil Rights is <laughs> or where it lives. Yes, because you're accurately pointing out it is not a thing. The Office of Civil Rights does it's not, not exist. I bet you there is one somewhere. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's it's uh, it's, for, it's, it's in Topsa. Yeah. I was thinking downtown it's out Tulsa. Of our, it's so. out of our jurisdiction. <laughs> you good with that, Cynthia? Yeah. Sure. You sure. Yep. All right. <laughs> no, thank you for those. Those are those are all helpful. I've got the WIDA one. What was the other one? DOE. Okay, on the first page. Thank you. It's, Under yeah. A. You you say Department of Education and just put yeah. DOE in parenthetically. And WIDA was just move it. I think we the, did it later. Yeah. Didn't know it was there was one in there. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Everyone good with these? Any other comments, questions? We have a motion and a second on the floor. All those in favor? None opposed. Great. Thank you. Uh, we do not have any unfinished business. That's how productive we are. We finish our business. Um, <laughs> do we? <laughs> Never. Um, all right. New business. Our favorite day of the year. Every year. Um, the consideration... Well. We, we will put the motion on the floor. Do I have a motion for consideration and approval of first read for the 2023-2024 school calendar? Maddie and Candy, thank you. I assume this is Cynthia? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, can you write that in there? <laughs> yeah. We're getting the official name of the, the uh, Office of Civil Rights. Susie's getting, we're looking it up so it's accurate. How many do you have? Two. Yes. Yes. Good evening. So this is the fun day. Um, so this is, <laughs> I'm going to find my calendar. What color is it? Blue. Blue. I must have left it over here. Thank you, Jennifer, for saying that. Like anything that would be good for the new folks who have never had any sort of input on this. <laughs> here it is. Really Tucked helpful. Away. Okay. So, yeah, in, in a way, right? So um, we are bound to, um, by the state, to have um, no more than five dissimilar days uh, for this sending schools to our Region 10. So, well, so Region 10 and everybody has their um, CTE school. So Brunswick, 75, and RSU 5, always get together at the begin well early late fall um, to start talking about calendar we have informal conversations then we have formal conversations and we have drafts um, this year we actually had an extra meeting because there's a new superintendent at ours uh, in region 10 um, so we had the principals we had superintendents and we had assistant superintendents all there at a meeting uh, so so that there could be some clarity. And what we learned from that meeting is at Region 10, there's two different levels. There's our level, which is the you know, 30,000 foot level. And then there's what the high schools do in addition to what we set for, the, for our calendar. So for example, uh, LL Bean Days may impact um, everyone being at Region 10. You know, there's the one day when the freshmen go, the one day when the sophomores go, juniors go. I'm just giving you an example off the top of my head. 
but every school, every high school has some days that they're doing something special that they want all their kids there. And so that's really what we learned that, that they wanted to meet about. So that really involved more of the, the principals talking. So that's why we had that meeting. Um, they were fine with the way we were doing our this level of, of the calendar because those days all match. Um, we have to be within five and just keep in mind that if I switch one day, if we switch one day, it impacts more than one day because that means it's I'm adding a different another different day. So that, that creates two different days because we don't have a uh, mark in everybody's column for a common day. So one day doesn't really mean one day, it means two or more days, depending on how many people want to shuffle. So I think it's really important to have that background that there's flexibility, but not really. <laughs> um, the biggest question that we usually are answering is um, the, when does the start of school? Um, we try to line up PLD when we can. When we can um, and uh, the holiday vacation, sometimes we're waffling between a day uh, of when to start that. So those are usually the bigger conversations that we have. Um, so that's just like laying the groundwork. Is there anything more, more, any more clarity around that piece? Okay. So what we always start with is I ask Ginny to uh, push forward everything we already have. So she takes last this current year's calendar and pushes it forward, and that's our starting template um, before we start having those conversations. And so um, I actually uh, own the chart that everybody plugs, all the assistant superintendents plug in the days. Um, we, we aligned really well this year. Um, we have two significant cha changes on this calendar that I'd like to highlight. So if we look at um, August, September, that first box, and you see Tuesday, normally we have had, ever since I've been here, I think, I don't think, I think it might have been prior where they had three days, normally we've only had two PLD days to s kick off the school year. We have, um, I should back up a minute, we have 5.5 .5 PLD days. That's contractual. So those, those are what we have. Um, so we have two of those days are the PC days, which are on um, November uh, 22nd. Did you see where it says PC in there? And then you go to April 12th. That's the other PC. So those are two days and those are for uh they're, they're compensated for the co parent teacher conferences so they'll work extra hours but those that those are the days that they have off and typically they've been where they are because um one of them is the day before thanksgiving and it allows for travel and that's just been historically where that's been uh the other day is prior to uh, a vacation week so those are placed there so going back to where I started, um, if you go back to the Tuesday, the 22nd, that day was moved from what we typically had in February. So I'm going to take you to February 2nd. You'll notice that February 2nd has an early release day there. That has traditionally been, or the last couple of years anyway, a PLD day, so a full professional development day. We are having that day next, this coming Friday. Next, next Friday, so February 3rd. So that we, have, we are moving to uh, the beginning prior to school starting. And then that uh, other day we're, we're moving the early release, the second big change is that's an early release. That used to be where October 5th is. This year we paired October 5th with the PLD on October uh, 6th so that there could be some looking there's there was um they, there's each schools looked at data and then they their pld the next day paired with that so we've moved that to the early release day one of the reasons we decided to uh, move the pld day earlier is because we are um, moving to the new units of study 
in literacy at the K2 level. We're also implementing the uh, word study at the 3-5 level. This way, we always provide our new teachers with professional development. I call it like the head dump. You try to upload them and onboard them and give them as much information so they can start the ground running with um, you know what the curriculum is going to look like. Well, this year, there's been significant changes in the units of study, and everyone's going to need that. So adding that day will ensure that every veteran staff member as well will have that opportunity to have that professional development. And I know that it, we used to have like a summer institute instead when we did that, but you don't get everybody there, even though you, you pay them. Not everybody is able to make it. So this way, if it's embedded in the calendar, we can ensure that all of our staff will have that professional development. So that was one of the big reasons to move that um, earlier. Uh, so we've always, for the last two to three years, um, we've had the early release days. What we did was I just mentioned we moved that one to that February 2nd so that, that we would have at least a half a day. We didn't have as big a stretch um, between um, you know, continual professional developments threaded throughout. We like to spread it out so we can revisit and revisit things. And then we also moved the May 1st to May 8th. That was just a uh, request from the principals to move it down one week. And then I think I, think I want to stop there. Uh, oh, no, I don't. Um, the other uh, thing I wanted to highlight was in December, you'll notice it's just one, one full week. Uh, every, that happens every so often. It's five of the five days that start on the Christmas day and go till the, uh, goes to the first. Um, and even though we're going to vote first read tonight, I had a, uh, an email from Brunswick that wondered if we had an appetite for maybe rethinking the 22nd. So I just want to put that out there. Uh, and, and no, they haven't decided either. They're all, we're all just in the talking stages about that. So um, depending on how you vote tonight, or maybe you decide to add that in tonight, because then it would make the last day on the 7th of June. So that would be a Friday. Um, I just want to put that out there that that's still one of the discussion points. We're the first one to bring it to our, po our to our board. So that I'll start there and then entertain any questions that you may have. Oh, and the regular PL, I, one more thing. I, I'm not going to stop there. I lied. <laughs> so um, if you want to go back to August, September, because there's some new board members, um, what we've done um, because of Labor Day for the last couple of years You'll notice that our first full, first week, the 28th, 29th, 30th, and 31st, is a four-day week because um, we've provided a long weekend that leads into Labor Day. So that's been like something we've done for the last couple of years, and I, you know, I think that's been a favorable thing for people that still want to go away. Um, and then our other PLDs, October 6th, that is one that all all of the district all three districts have in common and have for many years and i think i mentioned to you gc which is the greater sebago education alliance that's one date that m not all but most of the districts that belong to that um group i think there are 12 or 13 districts have that day so if we wanted to plan common uh, pd that day that was our intent and it all we started it right before covid and then of course, that kind of fell by the wayside for the last couple of years. But that we always like to keep that one common because that is, you know, widely um, the day that people have chosen. And then the PLD in uh, the day before Veterans Day holiday uh, on the 9th, November 9th, that's a 0.5 day. That's contractual. That it happened a long, long time ago that a 0.5 PLD day was added to the contract. And so um, I think, and then the other one we kept was March, March 15th this year. It's on March 17th. It moved two days because of this coming year is going to be a leap year. Okay, now I'm really done. <laughs> Promise. Sure? I think. <laughs> Maddie. I really struggle with starting before Labor Day. Mm -hmm. I, I 
continue to. And I think a few years ago, we weren't. I, I think that's still a relatively recent change. So I'm just wondering, with the addition of the early PLD day, the extra PLD day in August, mm -hmm. how big a change does this represent for our staff? It, is this a is this a whole week earlier than they came this year, or is this really just one extra day? I think we start on the 29th of August this year, if we look at... Right, but then now but now we're suggesting starting on the 22nd oh, of August. So normally the Wednesday and Thursday has always been the traditional PLD days. So we're adding one before, and we're giving them the Friday because we thought they would probably want a long weekend and what, or a day, day to get into their classrooms on their own. What week of August did it fall this year? It's the same. Same. So we're basically just adding Tuesday of the same week they yeah. were previously coming. And it was also the third week of August yep. this year. Yep. But it, am I wrong in recollecting that it's only been a few years since so, we've been in August? Yeah, it, it falls when the calendar, when the date falls late. So this is probably... I don't know. My guess is this is the last year we'll go before, unless there's a real change to methodology, this is the last year we'll go before Labor Day because then next year that Labor Day is going to be the second and then we would start on the third as opposed to, and it, you know. So historically the reason, because um, I think most people think about starting after Labor Day and that's preferable, um, but when after Labor Day was the 8th, it was really late, right? So for, for kind of half the time we're after and half the time we're before. So I think we should be coming into a before, or excuse me, we should be coming into a starting after Labor Day starting next year again, um, you know, unless there's a philosophical change on that. I just not wanted to check, make sure that we're not just creeping yeah. <laughs> backwards. Not philosophical, but the, you, one thing that has changed is uh, Juneteenth. And you could... If you extended it a you know a week, like going forward, like next year, it it could run into you go to the eight you go to the twentieth because you have to go to the eighteenth. You have to have the nineteenth off, and then you go the twentieth. I mean, it could that could happen. So that's a consideration. And the only other consideration um, might be um, we oftentimes try to have a some PLD at the end, and it's a week long. And, and typically teachers are really likely to come back. Let's look at this calendar, this year's calendar, just for an example. They're likely to be willing to come back that 17th through the 21st, that last week of June. They're, they're not, you know, just historically it's, it's anecdotal data, but so those are just a couple other considerations for next year. If, when we start talking about that, Kelly. Yeah, I'm just looking at the end of the calendar compared to this current year, and it looks like we're ending about six days later this year than this new calendar. And I'm just, is that a change, or is I'm just wondering I where those days you, are coming from? I can tell you two, three dates right off the top. So putting this, taking out the PLD, and putting that at the beginning, that's one day. You have um, we had an extra day of winter year. break. Yeah, a day at winter break, and then leap year, that adds a day. So there's three days right there that account for that. What's our current final day? I, th I know I ask this every year. Like, when we when we look at these, hmm. could we also on the flip yes. side include the current cast schedule? Yes. It's 12th, the 12th this year. Okay, you got okay. it, the 12th. Yeah. Well, we have... Is that with adding the two snow days that we've just? That's the current day if we do not have snow days. Okay. Yeah. But we've had right. two so far. So yeah, the 14th. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Colin. Um, just, I, I did look at the, because it's on my fridge. I did look at the current calendar and it did seem the other, that this year we have four um, early release days um, and the other two remained the same. So I'm just, I'm, I was listening for you, your that to come up, but we have we five do. and we have two. We have two. You know what your error is? I bet this. Okay, there was an error on this year's calendar down here that said four. It was really only two. If you counted oh. the days in there, there's only that two. The other day, yeah. she goes, "Oh my goodness, we never noticed that." Because the interesting oh thing about goodness. that, Colin, so you're saying yes, really you're saying what is on my fridge is inaccurate. 
Yes. In the bottom, yeah, but not yeah. in the actual days. If you okay. counted That's the what ER I looked days. At. No, 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 I was yeah. looking yeah. at that before I left the house. So, oh, okay, cool. Yeah. And I will Good say catch. that <laughs> I appreciate, you know, we have heard um, pretty frequently that early release days are difficult for parents. Um, I know it's it can be beneficial for, for teachers to have some additional opportunities to, to collaborate. Um, but I know we hear pretty consistently that it's difficult for parents. So I appreciate the acknowledging that and not adding more. Right. Maddie. Yeah, with that, and I know we talked about this last year, and sorry, I don't remember the, the specifics of it, but but having one on a Wednesday, I know a lot of districts do that, and that's okay. a traditional thing, but to just sort of out of the blue have one Wednesday early release seems a little odd. Why are we doing that? So the Wednesday is preferable for staff meetings, so then you, because that's when um, all of the schools have their staff meetings on Wednesdays, like we have our board meetings on Wednesdays, and so what they can do with the early releases they've got from, I'm going to make up 12. They're different times, but let's say the kids leave and they're starting their meetings at 1230. They have um, 1230 through their staff meeting. So they got a good four hour chunk of time or, you know, an extended chunk of time. So that was why we pair, they wanted it paired that way originally. And so the one that we moved to the second on the Friday, that would have been the PLD day. Um, the one that's February 2nd on here. And it was on a Thursday this year. And so one was and one wasn't. So the one that we had this year was um, where October 5th sits right now because we paired it with the PLD the next day. So that they could look at data and then do more PLD on that. And because we only have two, it, it's not a, like if we had them um, every month, I think that would be really, really confusing, whereas this is only two. And Kelly. Coming back around to your original question about the 22nd, mm -hmm. I'm just looking at the fact that we're already ending the school year quite a bit earlier than this year, and I'm wondering if parents and those who travel for the holidays might actually really appreciate moving that day to the end of the school year so that they can have a little more time to travel. December. In December. Mm -hmm. December. The 22nd. I, I agree with that. Six days is a pretty much the shortest I've ever seen a winter break yeah. be. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, this year was seven, right? Because we went, we had Friday mm -hmm. through the following Monday. Um, I'm, I'm supportive of that. Yeah. Okay. I think that's what the yeah. other districts would go with anyway, but... Yeah, I was okay. before I understood what the professional compensation days were. Just to clarify, those are supposed to coincide roughly with the parent teacher conferences. They don't coincide, but that's or, how they earn the time for okay. them, basically, because yeah. they work for the they work additional hours. So okay. in the contract, it says they will have two days. Um, so like PLD days, teachers are in school, but no kids. Uh, professional compensation days, nobody's in school. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I so I was originally wondering if the April. PC day would be moved to December 22nd to give a little bit of a stretch there and uh, but I didn't know if that has to stay if they have to if the professional compensation days have to be spread out more um, they don't have yeah. to but it's been a tradition <coughs> that you've had it on April break and I think mm. okay <laughs> Yeah, they plan that's fine. Yeah. I would otherwise <laughs> support a day off on the 22nd okay. of December. And moving the end date to the 7th. Yep. I would just like to say that um, I agree with Maddie about wanting to start after Labor Day, but I totally understand the calendar, and I think that this is great, Cynthia. So thank you very much for all your hard work on it. And I also would support having the 22nd of December off. Jen. You know, I uh, support the 22nd as well, just to, you know, to, to make sure everyone sees it. If the, we lose the 7th, that means, like, we're definitely, if you have a snow day, you're going into the following week, which I know is always a concern for people. <laughs> we I mean, into the next week. I, I'm never, week yeah, oh, I was going to say, agree. it's still it's pretty early. So, I, I mean, and it means it does not matter to me, but I think that <laughs> we always kind of say that about, like, ooh, do we want the last day of school to be on? A Monday, which yeah. it would be if there was only one snow day. Chances There's are. There's never been one snow day. Exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess my, my ask would be that as you guys are talking about this next year, 
yep. if the plan is to continue to be before Labor Day that we know before January so we can weigh in on those conversations to sort of have some discussion around that and so come to you in December yeah if that's I mean if that's what people are thinking um I just feel like we should be talking about it as a board mm -hmm. and um maybe giving you some talking points to yes. go persuade them and I think we did that last year uh-huh yeah because because when we used to talk about this we were the last one to approve yes we, and it was we, like we can talk till we we're blue in the up. face but we can't do anything about it guys yeah. so why are we doing this so yeah. we kind of moved back to conversations Mara. Just to make things more complicated, um, I, <laughs> sorry, I'm not going to bring up February vacation. I thought about it. You kind of did. You kind of just did. Channel your inner Kate. <laughs> Kate Maddie's going to do it, so don't worry. Oh, oh, are you? Oh, okay. Okay. I'm going to leave that to Maddie. Um, I agree with whatever you're going to say. Um, <laughs> uh, I would be interested in considering having the 2nd of January instead of the 22nd of December <laughs> or alternatively the starting school on the 29th of August so that there's a three-day week, then a four-day week, then we have a full week. Just throwing those two other ideas out there. Not all of I know we can't do all of them because we only have the variation for a certain number of times, right, Cynthia? Yeah, and we're yeah. there, and I think that I think one more will throw us off. Everybody would have to agree to that. Yeah, so we could only do, if Brunswick and Topsom do the 22nd, we can only do one other different day. Is that right? The t no, if we all do the 22nd, we'll be good. We'll be good. But if we go on the 22nd, then that's the only. If we win on the 22nd, yes. we couldn't take another day away. Is that somewhere else? Is that right or no? You're saying we couldn't even vary from, from them. Like if they, they all said, nope, we don't want to do the 22nd, mm -hmm. but we did. Mm -hmm. Are we out of compliance or are we okay? Yeah, I think we would be. But I think we would be what? They, we would be okay or we, we would, would be, be out? I think we would be out. So we have no, we can't deviate from this. We all have this. to decide. Well, the Christmas, the December, not Christmas, the holiday break, the 22nd. Right, they approached us, right? Mm -hmm. Right. So chances are at least two out of the three and, you know. We can mm -hmm. convince Mount Ararat. Um, mm -hmm. And one of the things at our meeting, and it's like, which which one do you do first, right? Because they called the meeting, was that we agreed on the start date together mm -hmm. at that meeting mm -hmm. to start the process. The start that date was, of the called. students? Is that what you're talking yeah, about? Yeah. Okay. Yes. And I think that in, in the past, it's always been that four-day week because – um, K pre K through nine, pre K through nine start on Monday, and then everybody else starts on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. So I remember the discussion yeah. before they didn't want to move that because then the um, ten through twelve only get two days. Yeah, great point. So where do we differ right now? Oh. Do you want to advocate for one vacation while she's looking for that, Maddie? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. This will take me a minute, so. Colin, did you have another? Yeah, I'm just fascinated because it seems like a lot of people have very clear opinions about this matter, and I'm completely agnostic on it, so I'm just, I'm fascinated by people's <laughs> very clear ideas about this. So would anyone care to elaborate on why we have very clear opinions about? People have very clear opinions on how they want their vacations to go. So we're not <laughs> actually, so we're not actually talking about what we're mandated to do, which is to think about <laughs> the right. well-being of the children and what is the uh, actual education that they should be receiving. So that really does, doesn't weigh in here at all. <laughs> <laughs> It doesn't I matter, disagree. right? What day I they disagree. start? I would say, I would say, no. I would say historical discussions on the calendar have been very heavily weighted toward that, right? Like the goal of not putting really heavy PD early release days in like January and February when there's already a break and there's going to be snow days. We've talked a lot about like consistency of of learning, particularly through the winter months, right? The holiday break two-week holiday breaks, teachers tell you all the time, too long. They come back 
they've forgotten how to sit in their chairs. Um, yeah, well, that's what I mean. Te- yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, so, you know, we've, we've sort of whittled a lot of those things out of this, and now we're just, you know, fighting at the edges. <laughs> Piper, what do you think? For the purpose of this, not that I'm going to be adhering to the schedule next year, so I guess it doesn't really matter, but... <laughs> Um, I would say the 22nd of December should be off because (laughs) it's nice to have, like, I mean, December, like you're in school for a while, so it's nice to have that break off and everyone looks forward to the winter break. So I think a longer winter break would be nice. And I feel like maybe it's just my bad memory, but as a kid, I feel like we had longer winter breaks than we're currently having. So the absence of that's kind of sad. So it's nice to have the 22nd off and have a longer break. I think that is also the scenario, like when the 25th falls on a Wednesday, that's when you get into the, you know, 10 day breaks, right? Because you, well, you have to have the day before. So now you're at Tuesday. Well, now do we just want to go one day that week? So let's just give them that whole week. And then you, you know, come up on the other side. So it really depends on where the holidays fall, both Labor Day and, and Christmas in December on how the breaks have historically gone. Sometimes they're in the odds are ever in your favor and sometimes they are not. <laughs> okay. Oh, sorry. Me? Okay. Um, so the voting day, you know, the November, so um, election day, thank you. So Brunswick, that, they're ha- that, that they have a no school day on the 7th and we have that Friday. The ninth, so there's two. Thursday. Uh, yes, Thursday. Thank you. <laughs> this, this, it doesn't have the days of the week on here. I just have the numbers, so I just sh- I just shot for Friday for some reason. Um, and then. What is not allowed? They're. They, no, they're not. Um, they're. They okay so. They're not taking a day. No. So even, even if we, because that's one of the things, particularly week. for 24. So two so, days right there. Well, this is 23. Okay, so this is just a small election. This isn't the presidential election. This is the presidential. No, no, no. it's not. No. But they're still taking it off. Hmm. Yeah. Because I know. So in, we don't need to because, well, it's up to you. Right. <laughs> not up to me. <laughs> but I know, I mean, specifically, it's more of an issue in Durham, I think, yeah. because the for for small elections, they do them at the AMVETS. We move them out of the school for safety purposes and, mm-hmm. you know, but for large ones, they still happen there. So, Mixtures. you know, if we could align a PLD where it was just teachers in the building instead of kids in the building, it might yes. make sense, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't but save us a day anyway because, right. because t- uh, Mount Ararat isn't taking that day right. anyway. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So that's one day out. Okay. So there's so there's two day that there's two days in that week, right? Because we have the Thursday, and then they have the Tuesday. And then Topsom has a day that they're in that nobody else, or that's out that nobody else is out. So that's three days out, right? So Topsom has they're going to school on the day they're both both Brunswick and Topsom are going to school on the day that we have our PLD, and then on the Tuesday. We're going to school, and Topsom's going to school. So if it's not three, it's, yeah. But that means that Topsom has to have another day off somewhere, or they're <laughs> starting earlier or finishing yes, earlier. Yes, they have. Or, um, Topsom has, they do the three PLDs at the beginning of the year as well, um, and Brunswick just does two. But that they, doesn't matter for this purpose, right? Nope, okay. it doesn't. It's kids' days that matter. The last day, okay, let's see. And it looks like Brunswick's changed some of the like they have all ones where they didn't before. So this looks like and they he didn't communicate anything new to me. Um, so that's common. And then in June, um, we have seventy. So in June sixth, we have a we have two of us going to school, and seventy five is done. Okay, so that's the pickup day. Yeah. Okay. And then, and then if we add, we're all going to change these. So, do they only have four and a half PLD days uh, for seventy-five? I'm not sure what they have. Um, they have one, two, three. 
four. Hmm. It doesn't matter. And we have the comp day. Five. They have five because they do the March 15th that we all do the March 15th. Okay. Yeah. So they have five. So have five so, and a half. They so right four. now we're two days out. Uh, three. Because the last day of school. The, or their, okay. Their last day. So oh, okay. Three. Right. So if you make one change, then it would Im- it could impact two days. So if we do the 22nd, I feel really confident that everyone's going to. But if you make one more change, that could impact it, depending on what. But right now we're three. Yeah. So if we made a change and it changed two, we'd still be five or less. Yeah. So we could do the 22nd if everyone else did and make another change. Or if not everyone did the 22nd and we felt strongly about that one, we could do that one. Yeah, exactly. I'm sort of, um, I could go either way on the 22nd versus the 2nd. Do people have a feeling one way or the other? So a seven-day break, but do you give the extra day at the beginning or the end? I prefer the 22nd. I feel like that a five, a full week right before the holiday break might be really long for the kids and for the staff. It's true. Thinking about the high school and midterms coming up uh, in the middle to the end of January, I feel like an, more days in school would be helpful. So I would I would opt for the twenty second as well. <laughs> okay, so we're, so we're open to talking about the twenty second. Okay. <laughs> no, I think. Um, do you want to vote on that piece now? I, I was going to say, are, are, do we feel confident enough that even if the other communities don't do it because I think it'll still keep us in compliance yeah. with the five we could do the 22nd okay yeah here we go so with that change oh. all right so this is sit a, back and enjoy Colin this is a symbolic <laughs> passing of the baton that started with Kate Brown to my knowledge and now I hold the baton and I I will be passing it to Mora apparently um <clears throat> where we where we ask the question why do we have two breaks one in February and one in April, instead of having one break in March, like most of the rest of the country and all of the colleges. Wouldn't that make things easier for families that have kids in college and kids at home? And do we just do this because of basketball? Why does one sport <laughs> dictate where how one state has their vacation schedule? It seems arcane and ridiculous to me and it would be so much more convenient to have a slightly longer break in the middle of March when most people want to get the heck out of Dodge. So it's a big philosophical question that would be difficult but I believe that this district could lead the way with our brethren from Region 10 and I put it to you to consider if not this year perhaps next. Jen. Poor Craig Sickles, if he's watching. Um, and we've talked about this, and I agree. Like, But unfortunately, in the state of Maine, however it happened, and we could lead, but then we would also be the, the last in line in that whole basketball thing, whatever. The other thing is, what I've also learned, having now two kids in college, they don't have the same March break. So to figure out, you know, so I, but I do think in the big picture of things like that would be a great move. I think it has to be a state level move, unfortunately, but I know you're just, like you said, pass the baton. And so, yeah, yeah no, I, no think, I agree. I, I agree. think it, it falls in my mind. It falls into the same bucket as we should really switch elementary school kids start times with high school kids start times. Like it makes a ton of sense. The science supports it, but you can't do it on your own, right? The whole state needs to make a decision that this is something we want to do. Um, yeah. I mean, is it really the way to go? Yeah. Jean's like, um, I mean, to do it successfully and well, right, and not to penalize your athletes or your extracurriculars where then they then can't schedule things and, um, you know, it's it's a challenge. Um, so I'm thinking Maura might be able to take this up at the MSBA if it's a, st- <laughs> if it's a state thing. <laughs> 
Tell so, them we've been you know, talking about it for years. Um, however, I, I personally disagree <laughs> with it. Um, I mean, I, it. I agree. I mean, I like that, you know, spring break is there in March for the older, for the college kids. Um, I feel like the younger kids really need that sort of like go six weeks have a break go six weeks have a break I just know for my kids that and I'm obviously just speaking from my own experience that it's something that has you know they they kind of like okay three more weeks four more weeks okay we can do it you know and then they're just always kind of looking for that next break break. and I think it would just be really hard on the younger ones and I think also on the flip side of that on the really younger ones having two weeks in the middle of March just gone I feel like that would really interrupt their sort of um, flow of learning but that's just my opinion I'm trying to remember Texas it wasn't two weeks off we just got out earlier we were done by we were done by Memorial Day and it was that was that was yeah. We we always went to school before Labor Day, but we were done by Memorial Day. And that was a that was a heat thing usually, right? Yeah. <laughs> but when you really need to be inside, uh, Piper. Um, I would argue it's not just the younger kids. As a high schooler, <laughs> you know, I look forward to that February break, and then I look forward to that April break. And there's a lot of merits to having, if you're a winter activity person, February break's really nice. March break, not so much. Um, April break, it gets a little warmer. And, you know, the plane tickets are cheaper because no one else has this break. So there's some good things happening. (laughs) You know, it's not just basketball. There's some merits. (laughs) Kelly. Yeah, actually, I was going to kind of um, say what she said, and that is you can also think of this as kind of a mental health issue for some people because about mid-February and late February, people are starting to experience some serious seasonal affective disorder around here. And um, you have the skiers, but you also have the people that need to escape to Florida for a little while. (laughs) Yeah. From an educator perspective, Jean. Oh, well, well, there. Well, don't worry, Maddie's leaving yeah. next year. Yeah, there, and, there, and there are a couple of things. I know um, when I would uh, was principal one year, there were a, a lot of snow days in December, January, and actually, um, the board elected to use some, a couple of February vacation days as school days because it was just the state of things. And what I know is we had we never got sickness out of the school kids were really really sick because they just sometimes need to be away from other people because of and that that's just anecdotal i noticed that as well um obvious better better educationally when you have bigger blocks i always like bigger blocks i know we're sensitive where we put our pd days because of that um but the other thing, when you think about snow days and pushing to the end of the school year, we're going to have a snow day. It's going to be more likely in the month of February than it is in the month of March. So you would, you know, likely did that you would push, you're going to push the school year even further in June. So. I will just say, bringing it back to, you know, what's, what's also beneficial for the community, which we've said is very important and not just our personal feelings about February or March or April <laughs> vacation. <laughs> um, um, that for working parents, it, it is hard to have two whole weeks and two different months off. And um, it would be nice to have it in summer where maybe there could be a summer camp or something else. I know there are February and April vacation camps. I don't know if we have them in our in uh, community programs, but I know they exist, which is, they do, which is really nice and and really helpful. But um, in the summer, there's just more options. So just putting that out there. Okay. So uh, we have a motion on the floor. Um, We did do the motion, didn't we? I don't have it right here. Yeah, Maddie and Candy. Maddie Maddie and Candy. But I'm gonna I'm gonna ask Maddie and yeah you guys were doing something else um, looking up the office of the civil rights um, I'm gonna ask Maddie and Candy if they would like to amend their motion to uh, include the 22nd. Okay, perfect. 
Um, all right, so there's a motion and a second on the floor for the uh, calendar as presented with the exception of adding December 22nd as an additional um, holiday December vacation day. Um, all those in favor? Not opposed. Thank you. Good job, Maddie. You made Kate proud. <laughs> you were sometimes. She sends. She sent me a text last week. Um, all right. So personnel, nothing. Uh, public comment. We've driven them all away. Um, <laughs> I'm just kidding. There was no one here. <laughs> I don't want people to think we really drove people away. <laughs> Um, all right, so do I have a motion to enter into executive session as outlined in 1 MRSA section 4056A for the purpose of discussing a personnel matter? Uh, Beth and I'm looking left. Kelly, thank you. Uh, okay, all those in favor? None opposed. Great. So we are in executive session. We'll take a quick break to close down IT and let Piper head out.